Sometimes I wonder where I'd be without you. Would I understand life? Would I make right choices? Would I live out my faith? Thank you for showing me what it means to love God and for giving me your all, even when it was difficult. Thank you for the discipline I deserved and the grace I didn't, and for being present, even though you had so much on your plate. Thank you for picking me up and encouraging me to try again, and for the little life lessons I still lean on today. The truth is, I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for you. As I look back on my life, I see moment after moment where your influence, your wisdom, and your strength made all the difference. Thank you for loving me. Today, I give thanks. Today, I am grateful. Today, I celebrate you. I love you, Dad. Happy Father's Day to everyone. I'm excited to be sharing with you on this Father's Day, and I come bright and ready to go this morning, as you can tell. Um, I've been a father for over 27 years, and I'm so thankful to the Lord for my kids, JP, my oldest son, Brooklyn, and Becca, and my son-in-law, Luke. I'm blessed by them. I'm so thankful for my father, who has given a legacy uh, to me, passed down to me, and that all started in his family with him. He was the first one to come to know Christ, and then the rest of his family came to know Christ. My dad baptized me when I was 10. He showed me what it was to love God, to love the church, and to love his word. I still remember the raggedy old Bible that he had. He had all these notes in it all the time. And as a little kid, I remember him saying, I love this book. And I was so confused by that because I love my basketball and my bike and my baseball bat. And I did not like books at all. But as I grew older, I learned that when he opened that book, that's where he met with his God, where he met with Jesus. And I too have fallen in love with that book. He showed me what it was to work hard as he helped me mow lawns and deliver papers, even early Sunday mornings before he would go and preach. He told me, or he taught me what it was to work hard at play. He loved baseball. He loved basketball. Uh, many a nights we spent throwing the ball back and forth, playing basketball in the yard. He even put in a concrete pad with a new goal so that we could play on. He cheated. I would back him down and he would tickle me so that I couldn't score. And that was his way of cheating and, and beating me. But my dad left this earth in 2018. So Father's Days are very different for me now, and I know some of you have experienced that in your life with your father, but I also know that some of you have had very difficult relationships with your father, or maybe you haven't had a relationship at all. So I wanna remind us all here this morning of who our God is. I wanna remind us that we have a good, good father who loves us very much. In fact, 1 Chronicles 16.34 says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his faithful love endures forever. And I'm so thankful for that. If you're a father here today, I don't know, maybe at times you feel like I have felt and you feel like you're just not doing a great job or sometimes you feel like you have failed as a father and I felt that way and I just wanna remind you that there's no such thing as a perfect dad. Jesus was the only perfect person to ever walk on this earth and God is okay with that. He just wants us to be faithful and to keep loving our kids. So when we fail, uh, let them know that. Repent, uh, ask for forgiveness, and just keep loving your kids. And it's my prayer today that this message will not only help us as dads to be better dads, but it'll help every one of us to be better as we walk in faith with Jesus. So we're gonna continue in this series through the book of Jeremiah this morning. And this morning we're gonna look at chapter three we're gonna see that God is very merciful with us even when we continue to break our covenant with him. And he is always desiring that we repent and come back to him. Have you noticed that as we read through the Bible year of engagement together as a church, 
By the way, if you are new to us here at Northside, you can jump into that with us. We've got little cards in the, in the Next Steps room that can help you follow along, or you can go to our website, northsidechristianchurch.net. But have you noticed that God's people keep struggling with idolatry? In fact, idolatry keeps coming up, and it's found almost in every book of the Bible. More than 50 of the laws in the first five books are aimed at this issue, in fact. And in all of Judaism, it was one of only four sins to which the death penalty was attached. God took this seriously. Idolatry may seem ancient to us, and sometimes it seems like a thing of the Bible, but idolatry is the one great sin that all others come from. The deadliest battle is the one most of us never realize is being fought. You see, we tend to look for the obvious. We look for addictions or visible low places in our lives. We look for relationships that are struggling or bad things that happen to us because we like something to blame for our struggles and difficulties in life. Now, I know those struggles are real and we need to deal with those struggles, but often we need to dig deeper and find the root of our issues. We must get to the heart of what is really going on in our hearts and what is missing in our lives and missing in our hearts. Kyle Eidelman in his book, Gods at War, says this about idols. He says, what if it's not about statues? What if the gods of here and now are not cosmic deities with strange names? What if they take identities that are so ordinary that we don't realize them as gods at all? What if we do our kneeling and our bowing with our imaginations our checkbooks, our search engines, our calendars, or our social media? What if I told you that every sin you are struggling with, every discouragement you are dealing with, even the lack of purpose you're living with are because of idolatry? You see, when Moses stood on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments from God, the first commandment was this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. I think it's easier for us even to be like the Egyptians. You see, Egypt was crowded with gods. In fact, each local district had their own god. So they had lots of gods to choose from. It's like going to Brahms and choosing three different flavors for your triple dip cone, right? You guys get the triple dip cone like I do, right? You put your favorite on the top, You put your second favorite in the middle, and then maybe you put a peppermint last so that you have good breath and and your wife can't tell that you got a triple dip at Brahms, you know. (laughs) But here's the thing with God. God only has one flavor. You see, when God says, have no other gods before me, he isn't saying no other gods ahead of me. Don't put me on the top of the triple dip. No, he means no other gods in my life presence. Wayne shared last week how God's people had made a bad exchange in exchanging the Lord for useless idols. And chapter three carries on with this message in Jeremiah. The theme of the faithless wife and the faithful God is continued from chapter two into chapter three, which contains repeated invitations for God's people to repent of her ways. The theme of marriage that Jeremiah uses in these chapters is so good because when we get married, we're making a lifelong covenant with our spouse. Think about that word, covenant. I got to officiate the wedding of Cody Muncy and Miranda Mello last weekend, and I reminded them of this idea of marriage being a covenant. It's not a contract for just a few years, and it definitely does not mean we can get a new one like a phone whenever we want or that we can add a hot spot on the side. The covenant means a forever commitment to that person. And it's the exact same in our relationship with God. No other gods in his presence. You see, when you go to the ice cream counter of God, It seems a little boring because there's only one flavor, but it's not boring at all because it is God. So let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter three and see what God says to us about this breaking of the covenant, starting in verse one. 
If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him to marry another, can he ever return to her? Wouldn't such a land become totally defiled? But you, you have prostituted yourself with many partners. Can you return to me? This is the Lord's declaration. Look to the barren heights and see. As Wayne told us a couple weeks ago, Jeremiah was sent to prophesy to the people of the southern kingdom of Judah. And this chapter tells us that Judah's idolatry was so bad, even worse than the northern kingdom of Israel before them, because they had seen the tribes of Israel commit adultery. They had seen them go into captivity. They had seen that they had perished as a kingdom some 100 years earlier. Yet, Judah kept committing the same sins that the tribes of Israel committed. They had broken their covenant with God. They could not even see it. And God tells them, look to the barren heights and see. When the covenant has been broken, the first thing God wants for us to see is our sin. If you can't recognize your sin and get to the heart of the issue, you'll continue to turn back to it again and again And again, and one of our problems is identifying the little G gods in our lives. It's so hard because when God is enthroned on our lives, many of the things that we make as gods, they're not really wrong. You see, there's nothing wrong with an ice cream cone from Brahms, but there's probably a problem when we're rolling through the drive-thru multiple times in a week, right? There's nothing wrong with working hard at your job, but there's probably a problem when you're obsessed with results or power, or you're obsessed with getting the new truck or new car or new vehicle or the next great vacation. Is God against pleasure? Is God against money, success, family, food, achievement, sex? No. God isn't against any of these things. In fact, they are amoral. They are morally neutral until they are not. But the moment... The moment one of these things, anything, takes the place of God, it becomes an idol. When someone or something replaces the Lord God in the position of glory in our lives, then that person or thing, by definition, has become our God. Has that happened in your life? Because it's happened in mine. If you know me well, Actually, you can see the shirt I've got on now. I've got clothing that I could wear every day of the week and hats for every day of the week, probably every day of the month. But if you walk into my office, you'll see a carpet, an OU carpet as you enter. You'll see a trash can with OU. You'll see pictures of games that I've been to with Wayne and family members and my wife. You'll see a poster for this year's schedule. You'll see knickknacks on the bookshelf. You'll see all kinds of Oklahoma Sooner stuff because I'm a crazy sports fan, especially for the Oklahoma Sooners. Now, our family's had season tickets since OU football games, uh, two OU football games since my dad preached there in the 1970s. That's my excuse. I always tell people if he preached in Columbia, Missouri, we'd probably be MU fans, but he didn't. He preached in Norman, Oklahoma. My grandparents retired there. Most of the family went to school there. Cousins even went to school there. But here's what happened to me in one part of my life, especially when we lived there. I was a youth minister in Norman for a while. This became a God for me. I got to a place where I would schedule things around Oklahoma football. If they won, I was in a great mood. If they lost, it was rough. It was awful. I'd go to games on Saturday night. Uh, When we moved further away, I'd drive hours to go to the games. Get back late, even if they were playing a night game, and come to teach or to preach on Sunday mornings exhausted. But I justified all this by saying that it was only a few times a year. But the truth was that it had taken first place in my life and in my heart. You see, I didn't quit serving God, but I'd put something else on the throne with God. We do that, right? We think that's possible. Thinking that I was keeping him in first place and everything else followed him. That's exactly what God is saying to the people of Judah through his prophet Jeremiah. So let's continue to look at Jeremiah 3 again. Starting in the second part of verse 2 through 5, he says this. Is there any place you have not defiled By your adultery with other gods? You sit like a prostitute beside the road waiting for a customer. You sit alone like a nomad in the desert. You have polluted the land with your prostitution and your wickedness. That's why even the spring rains have failed, as Wayne talked about last week. 
for you are a brazen prostitute and completely shameless. Yet you say to me, Father, you have been my guide since my youth. Surely you won't be angry forever. Surely you can forget about it. So you talk, but you keep on doing all the evil you can. Just like the Israelites, I could say all the right things and I could continue to serve God, but I was slowly letting something slip into God's place on the throne of my heart and my life. And maybe you too have been there. So how do we identify a God that is creeping onto the throne of our lives? God's at work. Kyle gives us a couple of great suggestions. Here's the first one. Look at what you pursue. Look at what you pursue. This was very helpful for me. It's what I had to do in my life. And when I did that, it became clearly evident I was pursuing joy and entertainment, pleasure, success from a sports team that I felt connected to because I had season tickets and I, my family went to school there. I had pictures with the players. My son had a picture with the Hall of Fame coach, on and on. So first, we have to take a look at what we pursue. Second, look at what you create. That sounds odd. What do I create? Well, the Israelites did this when Moses was on the mountain with God, and they created a golden calf to worship in Moses' absence. What do you create? Maybe it's a house that you constantly upgrade, or a body that is toned and constantly fit and healthy. A promotion that comes with more power, prestige, and pay. A team that wins a championship. The perfect video or post on social media. The child that is succeeding in every area in the world's view. It's difficult to see ourselves as idol worshipers, isn't it? I mentioned a few areas that we allow to become our gods earlier, like food, sex, entertainment, success, money, achievement, romance, family. I could go on and on. But there's a, li there's a battle being fought. And I think that Satan is starting to get an edge. And one of the places where he's really getting an edge is with our smartphones. Most of us have them, don't we? Got one in my back pocket. I'm not gonna put it up here so it doesn't buzz. Our phones have given us a new way to disconnect, truthfully. According to a survey that came out February of 2021, Americans average 5.4 hours a day on their phone and teenagers even more. Oh, not me, I don't spend that much time on my phone, surely not. Let me give you a personal example, just using Oklahoma sports. I can spend hours finding out things about Oklahoma sports. I'm a subscriber to Sooner Vision where I can watch recaps of games, post-game interviews, coaches shows and more. I have OU podcasts that I'm subscribed to. I have OU Twitter feeds that I follow. I have YouTube channels just for Oklahoma that I am subscribed to. I have the ESPN app on my phone so I can watch all sports in general and especially follow my Oklahoma Sooners that are in professional sports. It can become crazy. And if I'm not disciplined and cautiously aware of how I'm using my time, I can be on my phone for hours. And that's just following the Oklahoma Sooners. This smartphone can become a God, but I want you to listen to this. It can facilitate the God of my choosing. We can list any of those things that I listed earlier, and that smartphone can go to town. You can check this actually on your own personal smartphone, how much time you're spending on your phone. It can be very specific. If you don't know how to do this, just do a Google or YouTube search for how to check screen time on your brand of phone. I did this Thursday as I was writing this message about 5.30 p.m. I checked my phone and I had already been on my phone for five hours and three minutes. I was like, oh, I'm right there with the average. The day's not even over, I have to stop. Now, I'm proud to say that in my top apps, one hour and 43 minutes was on the Bible app, 38 minutes was on the Blue Letter Bible app because I was writing a sermon, but 35 minutes was watching the U.S. Open. 24 minutes was on Lyft, getting rides from my mom because I was unable to take her to the doctor that day. 24 minutes texting, 24 minutes texting, and there were a number of other things. You see, what used to be an escape has become inescapable. Is that true for you? Have you ever found yourself looking at pictures or videos or just scrolling through social media and before you know it, 30 minutes have gone, an hour or even more? 
And you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that much time. A couple of weeks ago, uh, JP, my oldest son, Becca, and Brenda and I went to watch Top Gun Maverick at the IMAX. It was, all, it was almost sold out. And so I like observing people. I looked around to see what everybody was doing. Guess what the majority of people were doing? Faces aglow, scrolling, waiting for the movie to start. Now, not me. I was in my bucket of popcorn with my plain M&Ms in there as they were starting to melt and get soft. And my family makes fun of me because I usually finish the bucket before the previews are even <laughs> over. But that's why we're there, right? To eat popcorn and then to watch a good movie. Or to watch a good movie and then eat popcorn. Well, you know, popcorn for me. When it comes to our smartphones, we've turned the occasional into the habitual. But it's hard to avoid when everyone else is doing it. Everyone else is on their phones. Kyle Eidelman shares a story in God's at War about a friend who went to India for a mission trip. And of course, he took lots of pictures and wanted to show everybody when he got back. And he was showing Kyle these pictures. And one picture caught Kyle's attention. It was a picture in a family's house that they had gone to. And in that house, he noticed that there was on the mantel, on the hearth, was a carved idol. And he noticed as he looked at it more deeply that every piece of furniture was set focused towards that carved idol up on the mantel. And uh, it, it obviously made him sad to see the sight of a family focused on this idol. He went home that night a few hours later and sat back in his recliner and had his remote in his hand and he slowly looked around the room and it didn't take him long to realize that everything in his house, in his living room, was facing the 50 inch that was on the mantle. And he closes with this in this story. I'm just wondering if we've gone from watching it to worshiping it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-smartphones or anti-entertainment. In fact, this weekend I was watching the Sooners in the College Baseball World Series. No, nope, no other fans in here. If I said Arkansas, you would be all be excited. I was watching them on my big screen, on my mantle. But here's what I know. Our own false gods seem to be invisible to us. I usually have no problem seeing everyone else's gods. But I will so easily miss detecting my own. So here's a little clue to help all of us see more clearly. Discover what the chairs of your heart are aligned around. I want to say that one more time. Discover what the chairs of your heart are aligned around. Amen. I experienced a really cool moment this last week uh, with Brenda and my 11-year-old Becca she came downstairs and we were watching something on TV together and she came down, sat in the uh, middle of the living room and said, let's play a game. So we pause it or shut it off. I don't remember what we do. And we were like, okay, great. Cause this is our introverted little girl. We usually have to pull her down here and here she is, she wants to play a game. She says, we're gonna each make a sound individually and see if we can make the rest of the family laugh. I'm like, okay. And we started making sounds and singing silly songs and we laughed and laughed and laughed. No phones, no videos to post, no anything like that. Just three people being silly and laughing together. That moment last week brought my heart such joy, especially because Becca initiated it. But it reminds me that this subject of idolatry is really a heart issue. Your heart defines and determines who you are, how you think and what you do, because everything flows from it. We read in our year of Bible engagement, we read it a couple weeks ago from Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says this, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Later in Proverbs 27, 19, it says, as a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the real person. You see, heart, the heart is the truth of our identity. If your heart's not in the right place, it's time to repent and return to God. In fact, that's what God's message was for his people through his prophet Jeremiah. Three times God asked them to return to him in this chapter. In verse 12, he says, return unfaithful Israel. This is the Lord's declaration. I will not look on you with anger 
for I am unfailing in my love. In verse 14, he says, return you faithless children. This is the Lord's declaration, for I am your master. And then in verse 22, he says, return you faithless children. I will heal your unfaithfulness. Are you hearing God's heart for his people? Even in their unfaithfulness, he was longing for them to return to him. Listen to what verse 19 says. How I long to make you my sons and give you a desirable land, the most beautiful inheritance of all nations. And we know the rest of the story. They didn't get that. They were taken into captivity again. God's heart is for you. Did you hear that this morning? God's heart is for you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you are, he knows you will not be perfect. And that's why he sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life and then sacrifice his life on the cross for your sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21, it said this way, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. God is calling you just like the Israelites to return, to repent. Peter reminds us the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed but wants everyone to to repent. Don't repent like the Israelites, though. Say one thing with your mouth, yet act differently with your life. George Whitefield, evangelist of the 1700s, said, true repentance will entirely change you. The bias of your souls will be changed. Then you will delight in God, in Christ, in his law, and in his people. I want to close with an exercise that Kyle shares in his book. It gives us seven questions that only you personally can answer to check your heart. Here they are on the screen. So I, I wanna encourage you, like Corey did a couple of weeks ago, this is a great way to use your smartphone. You can take a picture or you can use the Northside Springfield app. It's actually NCC Springfield if you've never downloaded the app. The sermon notes are always on there. These are in the sermon notes. Here's the seven questions for us today. What disappoints you? What do you complain about the most? Where do you make financial sacrifices? What worries you? Where is your sanctuary? What infuriates you? And lastly, what are your dreams? I told you earlier that my love for sports and especially the Oklahoma Sooners was becoming a God for me. And you see, it had become a sanctuary for me. It had become a place where I made financial sacrifices. And I know that today, some of you may need to repent and totally give up the thing that has become God in your life. I've had to do that with things before. As you can see, I have not done that with the Sooners. But I think for many of us, we just need to make some changes and that maybe they're like the ones that I have made. I wanna share three of them with you. First of all, I strive to take a weekly checkup and make sure I'm not more involved with, more involved time-wise and financially with my little G God than my big G God. Secondly, I've changed the priority of the God. I made an effort to include others, especially my family instead of just focusing on myself. Mark Knight actually has been a great example of this for me. He has Arkansas Razorback football tickets and is always taking friends and people from the church to make greater connections. And yes, to go call the pigs. Woo, pigs, you say something. I'm not sure what it is. Actually, I know. I hope Arkansas and OU will meet in the World Series championship. That'd be pretty cool. But for me personally, it's special times now with my son going to a football game. It's a date with my wife. It's family outings for the entire family or even extended family. And lastly, I've had to add more worship and expression into my personal time with God. Because here's what I noticed. I was making more effort to get to football games, to keep up with the team, even cheering harder at games, and then coming here and worship and feeling guilty. 
in my quiet time, not giving the same effort. So I knew I needed to give more worship and expression in my own personal quiet time with God and on Sunday mornings. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna give each and every one of us here this morning a minute just to meditate on these questions. To ask God to reveal to you where you might have a heart problem. Because a heart problem turns into a heart attack and it turns into spiritual death. You most likely will not have enough time here this morning in this minute to make all the assessments like I have, but I hope that this will start you on the journey. So let's take a minute this morning just for meditation and for prayer with you, God, your God around these seven questions. Father God, we know that until the little G gods of our life are dethroned and you, the Lord God and creator, takes his rightful place in our hearts, in the throne of our lives, that we will have no peace. We will have no true victory in our lives. So Father, may you guide us, may you help us to see the places where we need to dethrone those gods. And may we come only to you and only choose you as the God of our heart and the God of our lives. We love you. and We thank you for all you've done for us through Jesus. And it's in his name we pray this. Amen. If God has led you to some kind of decision today, we would love for you to share that with us. If you're online, you can share that by going uh, to uh, our email, to our website and emailing us, or you can text us through the number that's on the screen. If you're here in the room with us, you can do the same thing. If you don't wanna meet with me afterwards, but you can meet with me here at our decision point next to the baptistry, either after the message or after the service concludes. I would love to pray with you this morning. We also wanna give you a chance to share back with God the blessings that he's given to you. He wants our offerings and our tithes from how he has blessed us. So you can go online and do that. You can text that with our number that's on the screen. You can also, if you're in the room, you can put that in the boxes in the back. Let's stand together and worship him.